chat. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks, Noah. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself or someone who may not know who you are? Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, so I've been in the plant-based space for, you know, 25-ish uh, years. It kind of dates me a little bit. Um, got into it through raw foods, through health, actually. I got into it through, at a young age, I, you know, throughout my childhood, I was diagnosed with asthma. I had really bad asthma growing up, childhood asthma. And, um, you know, a friend of the family told me to stop eating dairy products and that, that I did. And at a very early age, got off all my inhalers and that kind of made that initial connection between the food we eat and our health, you know, and our health outcomes. So that really, um, you know, that, that drove a lot of my, I think my passion was seeded by anger at first, you know, so, um, because I was so frustrated that I wasn't, I wasn't shared that at a young age, but you know, and then I've been, then, you know, I wanted to teach it with whoever who would listen. So got into raw foods, got into clean cooking at, at an early age with plant-based. Um, and then, um, had a, had a bunch of restaurants, chain of restaurants over in Europe, moved over to Whole Foods Market, uh, led their healthy eating program from there, started Wicked Healthy uh, with my brother, which is an on, it was was an online community and we had some books um, and, and such, it's consulting and classes and all that and education. Um, worked with Culinary uh, Ruby, which is an online culinary school, um, launched their plant-based certification program online. And then uh, from there, Derek, my brother, who was also at Whole Foods at the time as the exec chef, ended up leaving. We started Wicked Healthy around that time. And then um, under that brand, we ended up launching, um, you know, Good Catch Foods, which is the gathered food brand, uh, gathered foods company. Uh, Good Catch is the brand. And then also spun off and also started Wicked Kitchen launching at Tesco over in the UK. Very cool. So we have a lot to cover here. A little, snap, a little, little snapshot there. So. Yes, I love it. It's a lot to digest. So why don't we start off with Good Catch um, being this first brand under Gathered Foods. Mm -hmm. How did it kind of come about? Um, and also, you know, last year was sort of dubbed the, the year of plant-based seafood. Uh, where are we today? And, and, you know, where are we going to be tomorrow? And how is, seafood, how is Good Catch going to get us there? Yeah, I think the connect the the initial connection came that you know from with my looking back on my career. I mean, it's all been driven by impact opportunity, and you can kind of see the progression of it from from being in um, restaurants to leaving a chain of restaurants over in Europe to um, joining Whole Foods and being able to you know launch a number of products within Whole Foods and also teach uh, you know have these education programs for customers around the healthy eating program. And then going to an online school, so having more of a global reach uh, with the education piece. And then um, it was a natural progression to get into the CPG space after that. So um, the consumer packaged goods space. So we ended up uh, launching the brand. We partnered up with a number of investors, starting with one of my dearest friends, Chris Kerr, over at Unovis. Um, at the time, he was with New Crop. Um, and New Crop, um, um, in talking and speaking with Chris, we were, wanted to identify the white space of where which plant-based protein, and, and it was clear that seafood was a missing piece. Um, and then from there, we defined it as where would the most impact be, and it was on fin fish. So starting off, kicking off with tuna because tuna fishing, as we know, is you know the commercial fishing industry is uh, highly destructive to our oceans and obviously sea life. Um, and so we wanted to come out of the gate and catch the attention with launching a tuna product. So we worked on that. We got some seed money. Um, the seed money and Series A was basically led by a number of impact investors. So really aligned on mission there, which was great. And then, um, you know, out of the gate, we ended up working on texture for the first year, year and a half. Um, ended up launching the product uh, just to get it on market quickly um, as a shelf stable product. Um, that was, uh, and then we caught the attention of Bumblebee, which is a you know tuna company, as we know here in the states, uh, and we brought them on as our distribution partner. So they helped us scale real quick. Um, we're scaling that relationship back, but also um, it it showed us some validation in that space, also. So um, so we knew that we knew that there was a demand for it. We knew that there was some validation of our products and where the consumer was going and the space that was about to really open up, and um, Following that, we ended up uh, looking for a co-manufacturing U.S. side because uh, we were manufacturing over in Europe at the time uh, from lack of line time to be able to find here in the States. We ended up uh, going through Series B and the B ended up 
um, really being the, having the focus of building our own manufacturing out, which we have over in Heath, Ohio. So we launched our frozen line, all our, our value add brands, uh, value add SKUs, which are the frozen line, like the ready, ready to cook uh, appetizers and entrees, and and uh, and that's where that's where that started. So, but really, it was real. It was driven by the impact opportunity. So, very cool. And how widely available is Good Catch at this time? What's that? I'm sorry. How widely available is Good Catch? Uh, um, at the, at this time, we're in in the U.S. We're in about sixty five hundred different stores, uh, 11,000 doors. So a door is uh, basically a category. Um, um, so, you know, 6,000 doors in the US and also in Canada, we're over in Europe and we just launched in Singapore. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about Wicked Kitchen, Wicked Foods, um, how that came about? I know right now you're expanding in the US, Finland and, and soon Asia. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, so around the same time, time that um, Good Catch was starting uh, Tesco, which is one of the largest uh, retailers based over in, in the UK. Um, they have a, a big piece of the market share over there. Um, um, they ended up um, launching, they ended up going, reaching out and, you know, reached out to my brother, Derek, who, you know, we're business partners with Wicked Healthy and, and just wanting to license the brand, you know, they saw our books and, you know, like the, you know, our YouTube channel and just kind of like the brand and saw it as being disruptive. And, they out of the gate they wanted to launch um you know a plant-based ready meal line and so it was completely under embargo and tesco those of you who know tesco was they didn't have any plant-based options at the time i think there was a fruit cup and a falafel wrap or something like that and so them really putting their stake in the ground as leaders within the plant-based retail space they definitely needed to do that and so they we ended up launching we ended up launching 20, uh, 18 or 20 products um, about four and a half years ago, four years ago now. Um, and we ended up launching out of the gate. And so from there, a number of retailers started to started, started to, um, you know, look at that and look at the opportunity. So three months in, you know, Sainsbury's launched some m and launched a small line. And by that time, we had doubled our line. Uh, fast forward about four years now. And we have 160 products in store under the Wicked Kitchen label in Tesco, uh, over a thousand stores in the UK. And um, we knew out of, from the early start of that relationship, because that's a licensing deal, we own the brand. It was licensed just for exclusively for the UK. We knew that we wanted to create a global brand out of this and, um, and wanted to have proof of concept with the retailer. And so kind of modeled that relationship after Tesco of kind of going deep with a single retailer in a single channel and we did that in the states so we formed the company wicked kitchen uh wicked foods uh in the us we formed it a little over a year and a half ago i would say and it's just been you know the growth has been exponential and just so quick with uh in the past year and a half we launched uh, nationally with kroger we launched 25 SKUs. we launched um um nationally with sprouts as well with 25 SKUs, all similar slightly different categories um, and then we just launched in Finland, uh, 20 plus SKUs and about 200 stores in Finland with the S group, which is uh, uh, the retailer over there. So we're looking to expand in Asia and expand multiple categories here in the US. So it's a, they're very different business models. One being the focus of a category disruptor. So, um, you know, Good Catch is obviously focused on just seafood and disrupting a category, a ingredient, you know, which is a huge category that needs to be disrupted. Um, Wicked is more, um, you know, skew, di skew agnostic so, or category agnostic. So we're in uh, 22 different categories in the UK. And so when we launched here in the US, we launched in five categories. So in categories, meaning like, you know, sauces, meal cups, frozen, frozen meats, frozen meals, all of that. Those are different categories. So. And can you talk a little bit about the vision for gathered foods? Yeah, gathered is uh, gathered. We have three assets with gathered three main assets around gathered foods we have one the good catch brand um then we have our manufacturing uh in heath ohio which we're looking into you know we're looking at a couple of jvs right now and and co-manufacturing partnerships um to fill the line time right now we have a lot of capacity because we have a we have a huge factory that we built um and then we're also we also have uh cfl uh cultivated food labs up in vancouver and they're they it's basically our our um, pilot plant, and 
um, you know, our, our, they lead innovation, R&D, food science, all of that. So that's based in Vancouver. So it's really like three legs to the stool with Gathered. Um, there is, in terms of where Gathered is going, I mean, Good Catch is a beast in itself because, you know, we're tackling the seafood industry. And as we know, there's, there's a lot of issues there, to say the least. Um, and there needs to be more solutions to keep, you know, the fish in our oceans and off our plates. So there's a ton of opportunity in the seafood space. If you look at, we consume, you know, 250 to 300 different species from the oceans um, um, globally. And, you know, compared to, you know, a couple dozen from land. And so looking at it from that standpoint, the innovation opportunity is massive, you know, it's endless and, you know, there's, there's so much work to be done. So. And you're expanding right now with uh, wing foods in Asia. Uh, what, what are you hoping to accomplish there and why Asia first? Um, well, wicked, wicked in wicked kitchen. So we just launched it. We're at, right now in the UK, we're in the U S we just launched in Finland. We're going to be launching a line in Thailand. Um, also, um, come summer, one of our investors is uh, a Thai manufacturer. They're one of our manufacturers also that um, produce some of our product. Um, so we're looking at a partnership uh, in Thailand for, for uh, to launch, you know, about 20 plus SKUs within the, a large retailer out there. So um, it's really, you know, and that, that goes back to, you know, choosing investors. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, really important to look at obviously impact investors because you need to have that mission alignment, you know, but also depending on how quickly you want to grow and where, what stage you are with growth and and, uh, capabilities, you know, bringing in strategic investors is, is critical. And that's what we did out of the gate with, with good cat. I mean, with uh, wicked. So. Awesome. What kind of issues are you facing with labeling? Uh, some plant-based companies are getting challenged by certain governments over using certain words on their products. Is that something Good Catch or Wicked has dealt with? Um, yeah, certainly. Good. You uh, see, the UK is far more strict than the US. You know, there's a lot more um, policy uh, in place for labeling guidelines in the UK. So. Um, if you just look at the package, it's fish style, fish free style flakes in the in the UK, and we call it tuna here in the US. So um, because there's no there's no regulatory on labeling in in the US, and um, you know we kind of put it out there as a challenge. And you know I remember when we I first did a a tasting for Bumblebee. Um, you know we always try and curate the experience, and I think that's really important for a brand. Um, to be culinary led to really curate the taste experience, whether it's for consumers or whether it's for investors or you know partners or whatever. Um, and so when we we're doing a the initial tasting for Bumblebee, um, I remember um, us asking, "Do they did they think that uh, that our labeling would be an issue?" And one of the women around the table said, "Well, I'd be one of the three people in the world that would be challenging you." And uh, they ended up partnering with us. So so it was it was interesting. So I it's uh, right now there's no regulatory around labeling and it is seafood it's you know it is seafood we do use you know um you know algaes and seaweeds and all of that so there's aspects there so um but yeah can you talk a little bit about how you're choosing ingredients for your various products are there ingredients you'd like to be using but can't because you don't have the access to them or they're not being produced at scale yet yeah, with Good Catch, we out of the gate we ended up developing the product. I mean, most extruded products. So there's there's a difference between TVP and HME. So a TVP, when it comes to making plant based meats, TVP is textured vegetable protein, which is what a lot of ingredient companies sell, which is an already extruded dried product, whether it's through wheat, mostly through wheat or soy nuggets, soy cor- curls is a TVP, right? Um, and so that's a dried protein that a lot of plant based meat companies start with and they rehydrate it and they blend it and then they end up reforming it and that's what a lot of these meat companies are doing hme on the other hand is high moisture extrusion so you never go through a drying process so you're able to achieve that that moisture and texture um, as you would a lot closer than using a dried rehydrated product so i think uh you know from from the early start we knew that texture was critical in developing a good catch because a cooked fish texture is very different than cooked chicken, cooked beef and all that, right? So we knew that we needed to diversify our proteins in the early stages. A couple of boxes that we wanted to check when we developed the product. One was we wanted to diversify our proteins 
in general because we didn't want to focus just on one monocrop, so to speak. We didn't want to focus on just soy or just pea or just you know wheat. Um, um, and then also we were looking at supply chain. We also knew our growth, we knew our uh, forecasting, and we we didn't want to be pigeonholed into one protein. So we looked at multiple proteins. Um, and then also for digestibility, you know, it's just way easier to digest when it's a, a combination of legumes and a single one for a lot of people. Um, and then protein count. So there was a number of boxes that we check when we're actually developing the texture. And so we landed on a six legume blend, which out of the gate, we were the first plant meat company to, to have multiple, multiple beans, multiple proteins in there. Um, um, so we're constantly looking at new proteins. Um, the protein space is only getting started. If you look at, if you look at, there's you know 800 edible legumes on the planet, and we're tapping into when it comes to plant-based meats, we're tapping into about six or seven, you know, and that's it, which is crazy. I mean, there's proteins coming down the pipe of like, you know, sunflower protein, vegetable protein, mushroom protein. I mean, it's incredible what um, the innovation that's coming out, and and these ingredient companies are seeing that they're seeing the need for that. So. Um, so we wanted to diversify out of the gate um, when it comes to protein with uh, with good catch. Uh, in terms of interesting ingredients that we've been working with at Wicked, um, the whole the whole focus of Wicked is kind of taking some you know familiar dishes um, and kind of you know putting our our culinary spin on them. So whether they be a little more spicy, punched with flavor in other ways. Um, um, uh, you know, using mushrooms like meat. And so really looking at a culin from a culinary standpoint, but one of the, a really interesting line that we're going to be launching in the U S quite shortly here is our ice cream line. Um, so we're going to launch a, a line of ice cream with, with wicked. We have, we have seven products that are in the UK. We have a uh, tub ice cream, uh, um, different flavored tub ice creams, which are incredible. And then we also have some novelty products, some sticks some cones and all that. Um, and our products made out of lupin bean which is interesting. So uh, unlike a lot of the vegan ice creams out there are coconut or soy or almond milk. Um, we're using lupin and it's it's such an interesting ingredient to use because it's very neutral in flavor. It's really high in protein um, and it um, you don't get any back notes of flavor. So super creamy. And so that's a really exciting product that, we're, that we've launched that uh, in terms of protein, so. Awesome, yeah, that sounds interesting. I definitely wanna try that. Have you um, had any trouble raising funds or convincing investors who may not be impact focused to invest in you? Um, no, we haven't. I mean, like I like I, I mentioned earlier, so Chris Kerr is also our business partner. He's their lead investor and our our, our uh, he's a chair of the board over at Gathered Foods and he's lead basically a lead investor through Univis at New Crop. Um, with Gathered, and he's also um, our my brother and I, uh, our business partner over at uh, Wicked. So, and also an investor. So, so his network with Unovus is is incredible. Um, as you might have seen, um, they just closed a, I think it was a hundred and sixty million dollar fund uh, that they just closed. That was oversubscribed, which is pretty amazing. Um, and their work, I mean, they're they're gathering um, a number of different investors that are really that see the vision to you know really be able to make an impact on animal ag and uh so with his network of, with investors and the spaces that we're both playing in with both brands it hasn't been necessarily an issue around around uh investors so i think the challenge has been um um really uh, you know thinking strategically is who who to come in you know and what where our expansion plans are and where we can lean on certain investors um when we need to, so. Have you played around at all with like a, a whole cut um, fish product at Good Catch? Yeah, there's some, there's a lot of great stuff in, in development right now at Good Catch. We just launched salmon, which is incredible. We just launched our salmon burger in the US um, and it's just, it's incredible. It's our, in, in terms of, in terms of my favorite product, I mean, it's also the new shiny thing for me, but I, uh, out of the out of the gate we have we have salmon burger we have a salmon burger we have a bunch of other products in the pipeline and as i said the innovation opportunity is massive and we have an incredible uh um, food science and innovation team so when Gardein was purchased um, by pinnacle years back um, they basically dissolved their whole r d team um, mm -hmm. during that during that acquisition 
And so out of the gate, we have been acquiring the old guardian team. <laughs> so, so we have some of the leaders on that team that, uh, that are just incredibly experienced and just really some of the, the, the best in the business when it comes to high moisture extrusion and food science. So that's, that's smart. Yeah. That was guardian fish. That fish product is one of my favorites. So I was also yeah. looking for salmon burgers, which look incredible. And I, I can't wait to try those. I'm curious. There's so much like competition now in this space. And, you know, I know we're all trying to disrupt, you know, the traditional animal based seafood industry. How do you differ and how do you kind of see your competitors? Our competitor, I mean, so here's a great example. So pre pandemic, um, plant based world that happened in New York was the first one that happened, right? And that was three years ago, I think it was. I believe it was, yeah, I can't remember. I mean, all the years are kind of mushed together. Um, yeah, so 2019, I, that was the first year that plant-based world happened. And it was such a massive success. So it was a huge success for your catch. It was a huge success for the plant-based industry in general, I think, because that was such a busy, surprisingly intensely busy show. Um, and we were the only vegan seafood there which was which was amazing and so we didn't we didn't have a booth this year but i went and walked the show and we had one with wicked um and did some sort of activations around that but there was nine different plant-based tunas at that show you know <laughs> um which was interesting and it and it's exciting you know because you know we at the end of the day you know it, you know we're all doing the same thing we're all if you know and all ships rise you've heard that term of all ships rising like i don't look at any of them as being competitors um i think competition is extremely healthy for our industry because it only sets the bar you know and and it's basically a, one it's a race to the bottom in terms of price you know so there's that challenge um but there's also a race in terms of uh in terms of um, you know, having that bar set so high. And I think that that's where, you know, Beyond Meat and Impossible did a stellar job with setting that bar high of taking a product. And here is, here's where it really challenged the industry, the food industry in general is until then there was never a product that you could cook like it's analog. Okay. So you would always have to like spray the veggie burger with oil and make sure it didn't dry out and you know, and it was always hockey puck shaped. There was never hand formed veggie burgers. You know what I mean? Um, until Beyond came up, and until Impossible came up, right? And so now they look they look hand formed. They're you're using it like the raw product. And so from a from an adoption standpoint for a consumer, it was way easier to adopt those products because they didn't have to do anything different. They didn't have to. You know, I just remember when uh, Gardein came out with the scallopini. You have to slack it. You have to you know you have to slack it you know put a little oil on it before you actually cook it you don't cook it like you would chicken you know uh, it's still one of my favorite products but it's uh mm -hmm. um you know just just looking at what what really shifted and that that user experience of what beyond and impossible was able to do um really shifted i think the space and set the bar very high for plant meats um and so i think at the end of the day the more competition the better because it's it's um you know really being able to meet the consumer where they're at and you know texture I, I would say is the most important piece with uh, with the plant-based seafood industry that everybody's sort of trying to figure out um, and so yeah yeah so but there I wouldn't call it competitors I would say that we're all you know sort of fighting the same fight and you know the more products and the more awareness that's out there because it be, it is such a new space that um consumer awareness is not there um whether it's brand awareness or not consumer awareness is not there putting the two words of vegan seafood together you know people are just coming around to understand that vegan isn't you know couscous and roasted vegetables you know and um and because there's um there's an aversion by a lot of just consumers in general to seafood like it's not like chicken it's not a, a base protein that people consume all the time um you either love it or you hate it right so so there's an aversion to seafood so putting those two words together i think is going to take some time for people to understand that it, it is a, a viable option you know and it is going to taste delicious and it is going to uh, function like you normally would have a you know cooked piece of fish or camp tuna or whatever so yeah i think the functionality piece there is important to yeah. not require the consumer to educate themselves on how to use this new type of product um what about your customers? Who are your customers? I'm assuming you're not selling this many products through Good Catch and, and Wicked to just vegans, right? Mm -hmm. 
No, at the end of the day, I would say, so we go back to the early adopter. The early adopter are the vegans. And so the center of the target is the vegans um, because we're run by vegans at the end of the day. And that's my, that's who, you know, you know, so the, the vegan customer is always our center of the target. But then from that center of the target, then there's rings outside of that, right? And and I would say, I, I can't stand the word flexitarian uh, because everybody is a flexitarian if you don't, if you don't eat, or if you're not vegan. <laughs> so you, everybody eats vegetables unless you're just Hopefully. You know, one, of, one of those raw meat guys um, or gals. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, the millennial flexitarian, the younger generation that are really making change, um, disrupting, you know, wanting to disrupt, wanting to disrupt the industry, um, wanting to make change with their food habits, I would say. You know, and also if you look at the shoppers in terms of the U.S. and especially around the U.K., um, the U.S. is, you know, it's it's pushing 50 percent of shop, shoppers are actively seeking protein alternatives. OK. And so in the U.K., it's like 78 percent. It was at least uh, in 21, it was 78 percent of consumers are actively seeking protein alternatives. That basically means that that if a shopper is going into a store, um, they're not they're not going to the vegan section, okay? That they're, the vegans are going to the vegan section to find protein alternatives, you know? This is why merchandising has been so important and it's really changed the landscape of, of retail, the whole layout of where it's being sold, what Beyond Meat once again changed the game on. Um, and, you know, you have, in the UK, you have 78% of people that are walking into that meat department. If they see a vegan option there, they're gonna grab it because they'll, they'll look for that protein option, that, that protein alternative during the week. You know, um, and same thing in the U.S. You know, so so really being able to merchandise the product um, really helps it. You know, and and putting it in the category it should be, and not just having a dedicated vegan section. Us vegans, we love going to the vegan section because it's convenient. <laughs> it's kind of a pain in the ass to kind of walk around the entire store to find your products. Um, and I certainly don't like going in the meat department. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, but if it's going to sell more product and it's going to, you know, raise the bar and, and push, uh, push the impact, I'm all for it. So. Awesome. I, I sometimes like to ask this question to entrepreneurs. Um, is there a time when you thought everything was going to come crumbling down? Yeah. All the time. <laughs> actually. Yeah. All the time. Um, you know, a, a lot of times I just, I, I'll finish up a day or I'll be in the thick of my day and I'll just sit back and I'll be like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. What am I doing in this position? So, you know, and it's, you know, uh, so Pete Spranza, who is formerly with 301 Inc., um, the investment arm of General Mills, he's our CEO over at, over at Wiki Kitchen. And, and he uses this whole, we, we're so aligned with this phrase is we're, we're building the road as we walk on it, you know, and it's brick by brick. And that's, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, every day when you're walking. I, I think it keeps it exciting being that nimble, um, no matter how large you get. Um, but being that nimble is also ter terrifying, you know, um, because you're you're saying yes to a ton of opportunities to kind of you don't know where the next direction is. And I love living like that, and I love running a business like that, and being a part of a company like that. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, you know, there's some very overwhelming times, but you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, we're all just, we're all trying to do our best, you know, and, um, you know, there's no, yes, you can go to business school to kind of figure out the, the, the ins and outs of investment and, and how to run a business, but, you know, surround yourself with people that are far smarter than you and just do your best to push the mission. And I think that that's, that's critical. That, that, that keeps my head on right is, you know, at the end of the day, I know, you know, I'm, you know, being part of something that's doing good and helping and supporting. Right. So anyways, that keeps me from losing my shit. Basically. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's back to a more uh, technical question. How is food service playing into the, the good catch um, growth story, given that my understanding is most seafood is consumed in, in restaurants? Yeah, that's been, it's been interesting. Um, So it's, uh, you know, it, it was pretty much put on pause. So we we've been put in a unique position with Good Catch because we have we have a culinary team, which which I lead with my culinary team and my team of chefs, and then we also have an innovation team. So most of these CPG companies and plant meat companies, they don't have a culinary team uh, and separate from that's separate from their innovation team. So we've been able to. So during the pandemic, a lot of these larger uh, QSRs and um, you know restaurant chains, they have looked at. Um, 
you know, because of budget and because of the struggles that the food industry has had over the past couple of years, they've furloughed their innovation and culinary teams, you know, so they've basically laid them off, you know, um, or put them on hold. Um, and so they don't have the opportunity nor the bandwidth to bring on a new product and test it and try it and see where it fits and all of that. Right. So, so at our culinary team, what we've really been able to hone in on is creating turnkey solutions for food service partners. So we'll go in and we'll look at their menus. We'll look at, you know, understanding how a menu flows and the cross utilization of ingredients and, um, you know, their, their ordering and ingredient needs and, um, you know, process uh, cross utilization as well on a menu. We can look at their menus and we can suggest a number of ways for them to incorporate it with little effort on their end. Um, and, and so being able to present that, and again, it goes back to curating that experience for the end consumer, whether it's a partner or a, a consumer itself. You know, if we're able to create a menu or a menu item that they can look at and recognize components or think about in their head, oh yeah, that'll fit within my current workflow or my current systems, they're a lot easier to adopt the product, you know? Um, and so it's been, it's been in interesting because we have had a ton of opportunity with food service but it's just moving slower than anticipated. It's picking up now, now that things are semi opened up. Um, and there, you know, um, I feel like there's been sort of a pause on innovation with a lot of these larger chains. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we, we have some, we have some exciting partnerships in the works and, um, I would say the biggest gaps right now within food services within, um, you know, the big players within, um, you know, institutional food service, um, like, uh, you know, compass groups and Elior and, and those kind of guys, because they, they service all institutions, they service all healthcare, all hospitals, all cafes and hospitals, um, you know, um, corporate offices, all of that. So uh, there's a ton of opportunity there. And there's a ton of interest there. It's just a matter of once again, you know, creating solutions that are easy for them to adopt and utilize within their current system. So we are coming to the end of our conversation because we have so many questions from the community here. Um, my final question to you is, what opportunities are you seeing in this space for entrepreneurs, investors, um, people who are looking to get into this space? Where, where do we need more R&D and just innovation in general? Um, where do we need more innovation? I would say, I would say, you know, making sure that, you know, you know, putting product out there that is that has that high bar is critical, you know, and making sure that we, it is, it fits within, you know, the current mindset of a chef, you know, of like if a chef or a consumer are going to prepare something, they should not prepare it. People are a creature of habit, you know, and so if you're going to add instructions on something that has never been done, or that's not done on its, you know, uh, product that you're trying to mimic, um, it's not going to be adopted. There's going to be that huge learning curve for the consumer and that's very slow, right? So um, to change behavioral change. Um, so I would say, um, you know, fit in where we can when it comes to be turnkey solutions for consumers and for food service partners, uh, whether it's, you know, a kitchen or, or a home kitchen. Um, and then, you know, veg, veg led, I would say is the next uh, big is a big opportunity whether it's mushrooms as a center of the plate we're doing a ton around mushrooms with wicked my brother's doing you know all sorts of exciting work around that um you know and just putting vegetables as a center of the plate i think that plant-based meats that taste and look and texture of meat are not going away that's only growing um but i would say that the more people that are you know uh, i would say that it's a uh it's a bridge to get people over to, you know, opening their eyes around healthy eating and uh, having more veg focused burgers, you know, going back to that, whether it's mixed with plant protein and vegetables, I think is a, is an exciting new area, certainly, so. Awesome. So our first question here is, uh, are you planning um, of IPOing with Wicked Kitchen or Good Catch or Gathered at any time soon? Um, anytime soon, I would, um, I think it's on, it's always in discussion. Um, it's always in discussion at this point, um, I think across both brands, but it's not in the, in the near future. So not in the very near future anyways, we still, I mean, we have at the end of the day, I think we all have this sense of urgency. Um, and, and the, this is what, you know, um, in terms of advice or sharing with anybody when it comes to investors or people that are getting into the space, if you don't have that, you know, passion, in my opinion, is measured by urgency. 
And so if you don't have that sense of urgency, then it's not impact led and it's only going to, it's going to be a very slow growth, you know? And, and I think with the reason that both companies have grown, you know, as quickly as they have is everybody on the team, the leadership team and the investors and the partners and founders are all, all feel this sense of urgency. Like we can't wait till tomorrow to make things happen, you know? And, um, you know, our, our, we certain the animals, they're suffering, you know, we need, there's a lot of suffering and we need to alleviate it. And it's, um, you know, if you don't feel that sense of urgency, then it's probably the wrong space, you know, so. Getting some hearts, love it. Um, from Annie, what type of impact measurements slash metrics do you normally bring to investors and how are you measuring your own impacts within the organization? Um, with, uh, with both is, you know, in terms of impact for good catch, um, I would say every pound of product is measured by, um, you know, we, we definitely measure that internally of how many pounds of product we're producing, which is equivalent to a pound of, um, of, uh, seafood. But if you look at waste, um, and cuts, I mean, out of seafood, it's probably only about 60% of the weight is actually consumed. So, um, so being able to measure that um per pound per kg that comes out of our extrusion and, and out of our plant is a, is a great way went around um the impact um that we're having with good catch from a seafood side of things um and then it's uh, and then when it comes to wicked it's animal free meals you know being able to measure um, um animal yeah, animal free meals uh, at the end of the day that's been uh, that's been critical i mean last year alone we hit almost 10 million meals uh, with wicked kitchen uh, being sold and that's 10 million meals without animals. So that's the way that we measure it just kind of fundamentally. So very cool. hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, let's go over here. Somebody is asking for tips um, for getting their burger into Whole Foods. Any advice? <laughs> so I was with Whole Foods for five years and it's changed drastically. So if you figure it out, let me know because they're still not carrying any of our products. <laughs> I was on the leadership team at, at Whole Foods and they, they don't carry a single Wicked product and they, they carry just, you know, one food service product and just our shelf stable tuna. But um, it's a, Whole Foods is a challenge. I would say, I would say the, the industry as a whole is, is really changing, you know, um, before Whole Foods was the gold standard of, you know, try and get in Whole Foods and you get that consumer adoption really quickly. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, um, other retailers such as HEB and Kroger and, you know, Sprouts, they're, they're, they're right there, you know, um, they're, they're, they're right on par when it comes to a lot of the same products and, you know, their natural sections and vegan options are certainly growing. So. We have a question here from Michael. You mentioned using a single retailer. Is this a strategy when expanding overseas? It's been, so looking at, yeah, this is where the business models are very different. So um, so Good Catch, it's all about impact for one category, disrupting one category, shaking the seafood industry up at the end of the day. And in order to do that, we need to focus just on that category of seafood, whether it's frozen seafood, whether it's frozen meals using seafood or it's a seafood department. So it's essentially one category, three categories, whatever, uh, within that same seafood space. Um, and so we're to, the goal of uh, the business model around that is as many doors as possible, is get our products in, in front of as many consumers as possible. And in order to do that, we need to go and, and offer it up to and have it available to what, anything across the natural chain, the conventional chain, e-com, all of that. Um, when it comes to Wiki Kitchen, it's a very different business model because our, our business model there is going deep with certain retailers. Mm -hmm. Retailers are looking to fill these spaces. Um, and if, if a brand comes in such as Wicked, that is category agnostic. I mean, again, we're in 22 different categories in the UK. Um, you know, if we, go, if we go approach a retailer, we can, we can fill a lot, of, a lot of their gaps. And um, due to supply chain, you know, especially these days, retailers are also looking at minimizing the amount of brands that they're working with. And if they are, it's, you know, more localized or it's, you know, capabilities to go national. Um, and so being able to fill those gaps for the retailer of fill multiple categories um, in working with the same brand has been a, a great strategy on Wicked. So we, we modeled that with Tesco and we just let, that's why we launched with Kroger and Sprouts as our launch partners here. Again, launching in um, 25 products in each, each, uh, in each store. Um, um, and then with the S group in Finland, it's, it's building that relationship and going deep, um, and being able to 
have them guide you through what categories and where the gaps are um, has been has been super valuable because we have a whole pipeline in the UK. So now we can just you know present that pipeline to these retailers to, to kind of fill those gaps as needed. It's interesting to kind of compare both business models. So yeah, absolutely. And uh, Will has another question. Um, how much product development did you do before you looked for money uh, for investment money, um, seed money specifically, for example, or are you bringing samples of plant-based seafood for good cash to the angel investors or your institutional investors? Yeah, for a good catch, you're speaking of, I assume. So we, um, so we ended up getting some seed money out of the gate because, you know, we, I mean, and it was, you know, I mean, seed money can be as little as a hundred thousand dollars or, you know, half a million dollars. Um, so we were looking at, um, you know, a lot of these manufacturers, they have R and D teams, you know? So in terms of commercialize, commercializing a product, no matter what it is, you know, if you, you're reaching out to a manufacturer and you're a setup brand um, or a, you're building your brand a lot of these manufacturers are also guns for hire you know when it comes to r d support you know across the board i'm not saying that's what we did for good catch but um so being able to kind of work with them in terms of commercialization of how this looks doesn't cost a lot of money except their sort of daily fee you know a lot of them don't make don't have a larger commitment now i think the bandwidth of a lot of these manufacturers are, is super tight but um, with Good Catch, we we got we initially got some seed money. We were doing some bench top, but there's only so much bench top you can do when it's a it's high moisture extrusion because you need a very expensive piece of equipment to do it. So um, so we had to get some seed money to do that and to get some line space um, at one of these manufacturers to work on it. And right and there's also a ton of universities. You know, there's a lot of universities that have R and D labs and that have scale up um, sort of pilot plants. Um, you know, there's a ton of universities that do that that are focused on um, manufacturing in the CPG space. So they also have uh, incredible R&D capabilities. So. Chris asks, do you think that the variety of seafood species consumed is beneficial or a hurdle in launching new products? Meaning, does it make it easier to match texture when there are so many different kinds or does it make your development less focused? It. Um, so one of the challenges with, uh, one of the challenges is, is uh, it, there is, there is a lot of species consumed from the oceans, but which ones out of the gate um, are consumed and which ones have the greatest impact to disrupt the industries of was is basically fin fish. So tuna, salmon, whitefish, and uh, crab are some of the top consumed globally. So that's where we went after first, um, you know, but that's going to, it's, it's also going to, you know, every, we're not going to assume we create a product here in the U S for the U S palette um and then launch that in japan and assume that it's going to hit this consumer demand it's going to be very different so you have to really focus on the market in particular um and so you know being able to adjust flavor profiles texture type profiles based on the market is is essential but um you know keeping that focus of the impact opportunity and the reason we started this product i mean we're not gonna we're not gonna launch a bunch of species um you know um if they're not going to have an impact on I mean, if we're not going to impact that industry so um given that a lot of people still think seafood is a, is a healthy protein um source how are you kind of fighting off this idea that you know plant-based products are processed some people accuse them of being how, how are you fighting that yeah i think at the end of the day it's it's looking at i think leading with the in, environmental focus you know um there is no argument to uh, to reasons of why people should continue to eat fish like you can, like there's no there's no argument that is substantial of why you should continue to eat fish so when it comes to mercury loads for for our health for the health of our oceans um if you you know sea spirits is a perfect example i mean yes that i think that film could have been broken up into probably five different films because there's so much information in there but um there's no denying those facts and and um you know from an environmental standpoint and the impact standpoint is there's every reason to not eat fish. Um, and then you can look at if people are looking at it from a health perspective, um, you know, again, any kind of large, large fish are, are extremely high in mercury, tuna being absolutely one of them. If you can't eat, if you can't eat a food product that they're classifying as a food product in every stage of life, it should not be consumed. You know what I mean? And you, if you're pregnant, you can't eat seafood. <laughs> like that's not okay. You know what I mean? And so people need to, we need to look at that of why, you know, and, and, um, you know, ask these questions. And, and I think at the end of the day, 
you know, people will use the argument of, oh, your product's processed and I'm just going to continue to eat my, my fish.